uh, we are very excited because as we come to the end of Hispanic Heritage Month, which is today, it starts, it goes from the 15th of September until the October, the 15th of October today. We are very excited that we're having two uh, prominent uh, individuals in our community. But before we get to them, let me just uh, run through a few key uh, information that we have uh, as it relates to the coronavirus. Uh, now, in recent weeks, we have seen an increase in the number of infections uh, of the coronavirus. This is true in at least 30 states, with some reporting some of the highest infections since the pandemic started. The U.S. leads in the infection worldwide with 8 million cases and over 217,000 dead. The first vaccine for COVID-19 will likely be available near the beginning of 2021, but it will likely be for healthcare workers and those that are at risk of dying from the disease. The first vaccine will be in short supply and must be available for those in most need. Uh, now, we know that this is true. Uh, those that are young and healthy have a lower risk of dying from the disease and therefore do not have a high demand for the vaccine. The goal is to have 70% of the world vaccinated and that is gonna take some time. Locally, over, sadly over 638 people have died in Washington DC due to COVID-19. Uh, be sure to check coronavirus.gov for the latest on the pandemic. Let me show you that website real quick because it's important that we keep up, we keep uh, up to date with the latest. Uh, here you have, this is the website you want to visit, coronavirus.dc.gov. And in here, you're not only going to be able to see the latest uh, casualties and infection rate, but you'll also be able to see all the resources that you can tap into should you need uh, anything. Now, let's uh, continue here. And... Um, Let's talk about this issue with Judge Amy uh, uh, Barrett. Uh, now, as you've seen, if you had a, an opportunity to watch the hearing, Judge Amy Co uh, Courtney Barrett's confirmation has come to an end and will face a committee vote next week and likely a full vote the week before Election Day. Assuming nothing out happens, the court will soon have a six, through, uh, six, to, six to three conservative majority, which is incredible. Now, the rush by Republicans to confirm Judge Barrett is due in most part to the weak polling numbers of President Trump. The logic being the Republicans want a Supreme Court that strongly favors them because the chances that they can shape the courts next year is low. Whether this assumption will play out or the fallout from such a rush confirmation hurts Republicans in the long run remains to be seen. Let me show you an image uh, in case you haven't seen what uh, Judge uh, Barrett looks like. I want, to, I want to put it up on the screen right now. Uh, here is Judge Barrett uh, so that you can take a look at it. Uh, now, moving on to other news, the um, 15 million Americans have already cast their ballots for this year's general election. That's over 10% of the vote cast in 2016. Now, six days provided partisan breakdown of ballots cast and of 3.5 million votes cast in those states, registered Democrats outnumbered Republicans two to one. The assault of mail-in ballots and the importance of this election has seen a massive increase in early voting. Long lines have been reported, so be sure to get out and vote. Now, locally, voting has started in D.C. You can mail your ballot anytime between now and election, election day, November 3rd. Remember, if you're choosing to vote by mail, the Board of Election must have your ballot by the 10th of November and mail no later than Election Day for it to count. In-person voting, early voting in D.C. will start on October 27th through November 2nd. Be sure to check the Board uh, of Election website. And let me show it to you real quick as well. If you go to the Board of Election right here, you can see a number of important information to include the uh, places and locations where you can find your mailing ballot drop box. There are uh, throughout the city. I understand there are about 50 of them and you can find them. Remember, you can drop, uh, your, uh, voting, uh, your, uh, uh, your election voting, uh, piece that you received, your ballot, your ballot that you received in any post office, but you can also, uh, send them, uh, put them in one of those, uh, mail drops 
boxes that uh, that you've seen throughout the city. Uh, here you can also find the early vote centers that I talked about. So you can check them out here. And remember, they're going to be about 95 of these places. So be sure to find one in your community in case you want to go in person. We're encouraging everybody to uh, obviously do absentee ballot, that is mail your 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 vote in the moment you know who you're voting for, be sure to send it in. I want to also, the last thing I want to mention before we bring our guests is this letter that I received from uh, Ambassador Jose Cabanas from the, uh, the ambassador from Cuba. Uh, he is going to be leaving the, the, uh, the city. You all remember that, uh, let me show you, Back in 2015, when the embassy first opened, uh, we were uh, pleased that uh, the ambassador extended an invite uh, to the opening ceremony. And here you see all the photos of a wonderful ceremony that took place back in 2015 when the embassy first opened. So today he sent us an email, and I'll just read a short uh, part of it. He says, we have notified the Department of State that our tour of duty will be completed late this year. It has been eight years of hard work, first as Chief of Mission of the Cuban Interest Sections in Washington, and then as Ambassador as of September 2015 with the reestablishment of diplomatic, diplomatic relations between Cuba and the United States. So as you can see, he is moving on, and he also mentions that the new ambassador will be uh, coming soon. Uh, pending some paperwork uh, with the Department of State. Now, let us uh, go ahead and start with our guests. Now, um, we have uh, with us two uh, prominent uh, per personalities that are with us today. And uh, from Gala Theater on September 25th, May Mayor Bowser announced a pilot that were allowed a limited number of venues to host live entertainment. The pilot creates an opportunity to resume live entertainment in a control environment that can be scaled up or down and that district officials can learn from for future guidance. One of the venues that was invited to participate in the pilot program included, includes the Gala Theater. A gala was founded in 1976 by Hugo and Rebecca Medrano. And today we have with us Mrs. Medrano to talk about what this means for the theater, uh, the, the theater that's located in the heart of Washington, D.C. Now, let me bring them on board so we can actually talk uh, to Rebecca here. All right. Okay, Rebecca, I think we see you now. Okay. How's Thank it you. going? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, and I'm pleased to be here for the closing of Hispanic Heritage Month. It's a wonderful celebration. Uh, we are so proud to be part of the mayor's pilot program, and we have worked hard all summer. Uh, luckily, thanks to a grant made possible from the city council and, and Phil Mendelssohn, Chair Mendelssohn, we were able to do a major renovation that included installing a new HVAC, very high end with MER 14 uh, filters uh, that captures down to 0.3 particles of, of, of whatever is in the air and filters it. And this is a system that's better than most museums and schools. So we're very fortunate and we're able to put that in. We're able to paint and get new carpeting and totally renovate the theater so it will be safe for our audiences and our artists. We are also taking a lot of precautions. Uh, the artists are rehearsing in a bubble. They've all been quarantined. The Mary Center has been a fantastic partner in testing our artists. We're tracking them until we open. And we will be doing a safe opening on October 29 with El Perro de Hortelano, which is one of the most famous comedies of Boca de Vega, celebrating our heritage. Over the top, funny about class warfare and the division of class, something that rich and not. Uh, and not so rich, um, and it's a very, I think, relevant play, a lot of gender switching, uh, only seven characters playing 24 because of social distancing, so that adds to the humor. Uh, we also have to space people five seats apart, and we are only allowed to have 25 people in the audience because there has to be a total of only 50 in the venue, including artists and backstage and, and, and everything. So very limited public. Um, we're still excited even to play for these few 
people because for us it is very important that our artists, our Latinx artists, continue to work and want to bring something uplifting to the community in these trying times, something that will make people laugh and provide employment. Also very important is keeping some of our Paso Nuevo youth employed. In our free after school program, many of these youth are single parents. Most of them are single parent children of immigrant families. Their parents have been working uh, service jobs. And so to them, they had to give up their part-time jobs uh, plus do virtual school. So this is an outlet and also a source of employment that helps them support their families in the community. So um, if you are going to come, it's by reservation only, and you have to go to the website, www.ballatheater.org, or call us at 202-234-7174 so that we can reserve a safe place for you. Uh, we look forward to it, and muchísimas gracias. Yeah, okay. For first, uh, let's go back. Uh, I'm, I'm showing the audience here uh, some photos that you provided to me. Um, can you tell us what these photos mean? I have, I started at the beginning and they are, a lot of them depict images and their seals. Uh, so what are, are okay, these? So, right, well, the, the temple was an historic landmark built in 1922 that had a lot of, it had the city seal there. It had some uh, very ornate uh, plaster work that's been restored by uh, the eight brothers, the Son Bolivianos, the Bolivian company. Um, and very careful and specific restoration of ornamental plaster. So the main dome had not been completed. We started it when we opened the theater. Now we can finally complete it with the gold gilding and with all of the details. There are cherubs, there's a face of Homer, there's the city signs. So that's all been completed. We have two smaller domes that you may have photos of as well, Frank. And I am I'm not looking at these photos now, so... Tell me if I'm not describing what you see, but there are two smaller domes. We've also finished restoring those. Um, I think you also have pictures of the lobby. Maybe first you have the, the theater space and then the lobby, which would show the bar area and the new carpet and the new lobby furniture. Um, I think you have a photo of that as well. That's right. We do. We're, we're seeing it right now. It and is, seats that I think you saw the seats before that have all been deep cleaned and have protective uh, handles now, plastic protective handles, so that people will not, you know, contact anything if somebody's touched them. They'll be wiped out before and after each performance, and the whole space will be deep cleaned. So remind us again when were these renovations completed? Just now. They've just been completed right now. Oh, just, wonderful. Yeah, wow, we that already. We did them while we were shuttered and within the government's fiscal year because those funds had to be used by September 30th, and they were. Uh, we completed on time and reported on time. Uh, the theater's looking beautiful. So we were very fortunate while we were shuttered. We didn't have any performances, but we were able to do this renovation. Of course, you know, coming up, we need the support of, of our community because there will be very little ticket income. And, you know, this grant is over, so we're looking towards, you know, the support of the community as we move forward safely and open safely. And please, you know, we, we, we want you to come and laugh and to enjoy one of the best comedies in Spanish literature. Wonderful. Now, okay, so let's go back and remind the audience about the play. Uh, when it is and how they can, uh, how many people are going to be allowed to come in and how they can get tickets. I have the website right in front of me. Uh, only 25 tickets. We are sold out for the 30th. We have tickets for the 29th and the 1st and the 2nd. So only that we can. Then we have to wait to see about approval. There will be a reassessment of it and we hope to move forward and take them through the end of the month. But we have to report uh, people who were there. We're keeping track, so we can track anybody who happened to, hopefully not, but by some misfortune get sick, we will have all the information to track everybody. Uh, but they can call 202-234-7174 or visit us. The best is to go to the website. But if you do have problems because the seating, since they're only 25 and they're scattered around the space, you may want to call our box office and speak to Samantha, um, calling 202-234-7174, and she can help you find the right seat. Wonderful. And this would be for El Perro del Otelano, uh, uh, played by Lope de Vega, right? 
Exactly. It was adapted by Paco Gomez to make it more accessible to audiences, directed by Jose Zayas, who was a Puerto Rican director. And we have a cast, a wonderful cast of artists, um, Spanish artists, artists from here, uh, one from New York and Miami, but mostly from D.C. So we would love to, as I say, have, welcome everybody. But do, we only take reservations. Everybody will be required to have the temperature taken before they get into the theater. And you will sanitize your hands. We have um, professional sanitizing stations, the people tracking temperatures. And of course, everybody is required to wear a mask. All volunteers will also have gloves and masks on. And the actors will be 20 feet away from you behind a bubble of plastic glass, which serves to protect audience and them, as well as convey the symbol of class warfare, which is part of this comedy. Wonderful, wonderful. And so let me remind folks, you can go to galatheater.org and you can check out their programming and remember the limited engagement that they're going to have starting uh, October 29th. And uh, there's a limited engagement in that you can only have up to 25 people in the uh, venue. Correct, uh, uh, Rebecca? Correct. It's 50 people, including backstage, volunteers, the bar. So we have to make sure that we can probably, when there are fewer volunteers in the space, it can possibly go up to 30 audience, but we can't have more than 50 people inside the venue at a time. Very good. Wonderful. So be sure to check their website. If you have any questions, there are contact, there's contact information on the website. And we look forward to uh, joining the theater. And hopefully uh, soon we'll get more, uh, the opportunity to get more people, right, inside of the theater as we get. We are hoping. We are hoping little by little people staying safe and seeing how this works and continuing to take the precautions. But, but we welcome you. We want you to have a wonderful evening of laughter and, and some some relief from the current pressures. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all that important information, thank Rebecca. Thank you, Franklin, for having me. Also, now, Dialogue, let's move on now to our second guest. Dialogue on Diversity is a not for for profit ed education organization. The organization was founded in 1990. Dialogue and Diversity hosts local and national seminars and conferences targeted to women in many other countries, diverse ethnic and cultural communities. It continues its dedication to the advancement of the social and political status of women, and in particular to promotion of their economic effectiveness through skill entrepreneurship. The organization recently celebrated its 30th year anniversary with an online seminar, which included some of the most prominent entrepreneurs in the nation. And we are fortunate today to have with us its founder and CEO, Maria Cristina Caballero. Thank you for joining us and welcome, Maria. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Franklin. We do so well to inform our community what everybody is doing, especially uh, groups like Dialogue, who's been around 30 years, you know, trying to educate our communities, women, ethnic communities about entrepreneurship, uh, technology, uh, and networking and education to promote their businesses um, in many directions and, um, and uh, in many directions, in a way, education can be uh, communicated. Uh, actually, what has happened with us for, for from the beginning where we started with a dialogue in different parts of the country, uh, Panama was one, and then, believe it or not, a group of women who were um, very ambitious about working with the dialogue and an invitation for going to Russia at the time, you know, got this organization started. So we kind of became very brave because we figured we, we got to that part of the world and came back then we can do a lot more things. And actually, the, the purpose for that dialogue at the time, uh, in many ways, is about entrepreneurship and about diversity and how different groups and different organizations can be working with each other and using uh, the American woman as a, as a model of, of entrepreneurship and, you know, consistency. So we were very delighted to that with that. And I was... I'm actually almost breathless at the way we were able to trans transform ourselves from a, mainly a colloquium, a seminar type of discussions into 
what we're doing now on webinars. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge and we are very delighted that we have this opportunity to do it because this is the way we're going to communicate with everybody. We need to be skilled in that technology, uh, enable us to reach larger and and uh, larger and di distant places in, in the world. And so um, we're, we're, of course, part of the Beijing conference many years ago, a uh, women's uh, conference uh, in Beijing at the time, where a million women were the reason for going to China at the time. Well, that was history, right? <laughs> so you can tell how much history this organization has had. And we've moved from uh, simple uh, opportunities to network, to constructing connections and uh, entrepreneurial opportunities for women in different levels, from government to um, uh, folks from, from different uh, house, houses of representatives and organizations and corporations. And you, Franklin, described the organization very well. Thank you so much. <laughs> and actually to describe the programs we have been doing now is um, starts generally in the year with a with an internet data privacy colloquium you know the, with that it shows us and the woman entrepreneur latina women precisely that they need to be informed about how certain rights that th they have are being violated through the privacy abuses of some corporations and organizations and it's a big deal actually and then we work there with a, with a program on issues that have to, uh, women's issues that we call the history of women's, um, uh, women of histories, women's history program. It has to do with domestic issues, uh, how to manage your home, to balance work and, um, and employment. And then uh, further on in the year, we have uh, programs on healthcare. Healthcare has been a very big topic this year, you know, and all of us, and that's why I'm talking to you from where I am, and we're all talking to each other <laughs> from distant places because of COVID. And so that was one of the biggest issues that we have been working to identify and to, uh, to inform our communities and our women that COVID is nothing, uh, nothing that you might take lightly. It's a very serious issue. And so we don't know when, when would, will this, uh, uh, this problem uh, uh, correct itself. It doesn't look like it's quite early or I mean, it's not any sooner. But in the meantime, what we have advised everybody is to keep safe, you know, maintain your distance and to hold the opportunities that you have that you like, for instance, going to entertainment places, but to maintain the distance and to, of all things, put the mask on, you know? And so that's one of the other topics we hold. And then, uh, and then the entrepreneurship aspect of, um, of our programs is, is very important. Uh, now, uh, I should can, I should know, um, PPP monies did not come to our Latina women businesses. And so we have to find a way in which we can work with each other. And we can, you know, we can work with each other. It's very difficult sometimes because we are very um, opinionated on one thing and we want to do things a certain way, but we can help out with um, all kinds of opportunities for each other, you know, to try to, um, what do you call it? Um, Sure. Encourage each other in different aspects. That, yeah, the thirtieth anniversary. I thought I was impressed to be able to do that. We had some real entrepreneurs who, whom I knew from way back when we had some of the events at the OAS, Organization of American States, at the time where we were working very closely with ambassadors. And one of them is the lady who spoke about uh, entrepreneurship IT with us at the the program that you probably were attending and then uh, we had somebody from the de deputy director or deputy secretary of state from uh from maryland to speak on the international dimensions of entrepreneurship uh, and then we had we were able to uh, have somebody from the from the district from virginia after mark warner to talk, take us talk to us about 
why it is that we did, our Latina women or our Latinos, our communities did not get, you know, the money that they need to, you know, to, to build it. But we have to be consistent, I think. We just need to be consistent and be, uh, be, uh, uh, be, be able to connect with each other so that we can do better. And then, of course, we talked about what is the model that we can, uh, what, how can we find a model in the future uh, to encourage uh, entrepreneurship? Is it going to be the same or is it going to be different? And of course, with what is happening in our country, in our communities, there's going to be a new model. And, and that model I see is the way we work with each other in, in a technological way. You know? and, and I'm very convinced that's, that's the way we're going to be working from now on. And not only that, that we're not going to give it up because it just worked well, you know, in many instances. And of course, there'll be a lot of places it might not be as useful and maybe not as efficient, right? It's the word to do that. And then, so we were able to, believe it or not, give awards through the internet. Believe it or not, I, we mailed the, the awards to different folks. Some of them got it in time, some didn't get it on time. And that's about what we do actually at the, uh, uh, on our anniversary, uh, the 25th one, we celebrated Microsoft, and this year they were offering to host us again, but that was not possible because of, of the pandemic. But um, our crowd were able to accept the awards, the honorees, and we were able to accept the award and be thankful and to, to encourage folks to keep on. Now, if you want to ask me, where are we going from here? I couldn't tell you, but all I can say is that we believe in our in ourselves. We believe in our cause, and we believe that we have to march on. And also, the word "no" never exists in this organization, you know, because we have to persist. We've done it before. We can do it again. It might not be exactly the way you want it, but it's going to be close, and, and we can improve from that, you know. So I'm delighted to be able to tell you what I think about the organization. And of course, if I was to identify how we move from, from the 10th year to the 15th year to the 20th year, 25th year, it's going to take me an entire day. <laughs> but uh, I'm delighted that you uh, um, join in to listen to what we have done. And also to let you know, we've got all kinds of programs we're promoting. One of them is, of course, we're telling you all to go vote and get counted, you know? That's what you need to do. To be able to participate in the environment that we're in, you have to be able to be present, to talk about who you are and what you can do. And of course, we've been part of the census count. That's one project we've done in 2010 and we did it again in 2020 and we're very delighted that we can. And so um, I think there's a lot more things we can talk about, but. I always tell everybody at, the, at all the sessions that we've had that to please stay safe and please connect. Call us with anything that you have in a way of minds, ideas, or whatever. And so talking about ideas, I'm going to let you know that we're holding a children's holiday uh, in spite of the pandemic on the 15th, I mean, 12th of December. And we're looking for a space, actually. And so we have a lot of volunteers already who want to help out to give the toys. So we're not going to be able to do the regular performances that the children like to do and bring a DJ to play the music, right? But at least we can have the children there to line up, pick up the toys and say, hey, I got something for Christmas. And maybe see Santa Claus. I'm talking about having a cardboard of Santa Claus. <laughs> Maybe they can pose with the cardboard, you know? <laughs> uh, that would be about what I'm thinking. So I'm very optimistic about what we can do. And I also want to tell you that it's a good thing we love each other, you know, because that's what makes our world go round. <laughs> and so I'm very delighted and happy and to let me know where we can be of help and how we can improve the position of our communities, our Latina women, in our environment, you know, you know, there's housing issues, environmental issues, cultural issues, my God, so many other things that we need to be concerned about. But as you can tell, dialogue revolves with the issues and the concerns 
that the organization faces, you know. That's what diversity is all about. I mean, you all know that already. I don't have to tell you. But I want to thank you, Franklin, for being such a great support for Dialogue. We always come and greet my ch the children who come to this event, and they are also happy to see you, you know? And if you if you were able to perform, we'd ask you to perform. <laughs> <laughs> One day, right? You told us a story about Santa Claus, Papa Noel, and so on. That was so lovely. And I thank you again. And uh, the best to everyone. Okay? God bless. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, but I wanted to ask you about, uh, I am right now on your website, dialogueondiversity.org. I wanted okay. to ask you a quick question, and that is, I did attend your uh, the, the 30th year anniversary of Dialogue on Diversity, and I noticed it was a record, uh, you know, turnout. And so I just wanted oh, yeah. to get your feeling on how did being in person, did you, how do you, as you ad adapt and adjust, obviously the theater has had more challenging, uh, you know, doing performances online. So I don't know that is, um, is a, a, a good assessment to say that, uh, you know, COVID has shifted them because it's just such a different art form. It's just so much more yeah. difficult to, to, to put into, uh, yeah. a, uh, a virtual environment. But in your case, have you found, because I noticed you, you've continued to, to host your, your conferences. Yes. Have you noticed? And I've noticed that actually kind of more people show up to, to this virtual conference. And I think, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. It would be nice. Um, I, uh, I actually, what we've done is, uh, my son, by the way, got involved in this because I was, I thought I hired somebody who was going to work with me on the webinars, but at some, some point this lady decided she was going to support a candidate. So she left, she didn't uh, pursue it. But what I, what um, my son does is he uses Zoom and he has this um, program that he uses where you send everybody an invitation and then, you know, they respond. When they respond, you send them um, announcements uh, a week after uh, that the week that it's happening, uh, two weeks, and then he sends uh, reminders, uh, something like probably the day before, the hour before, and and so many different. I ask him if I can. I tell him to to let you know. But that's what it is. What it is is reminding our crowd that you are light and we want you, you want to be with us, you know? And I think that's what it is. But I've been really successful uh, with attendance. I'm, I'm very pleased. And of course, the first one was even more than I thought expected. So over like 98 people were there. You know, I guess they were all wanting to see whether we were going to do it or not. <laughs> but we were quite successful. Thank you so much for the compliment. But I could suggest that, that uh, perhaps the announcement is uh, sent, like, uh, if you can do something like a, an announcement that you might call, uh, save the date, perhaps, and then send an announcement two weeks after you sent the, the date of it, of the date that you're planning to do it, and then send an announcement, something like a week or two before, and then the week that it happens or the day that it happens, send an announcement again to remind them, you know, that you are wanted and we want you there. That would be the way I would do it. Wonderful, right. wonderful. Well, let me... Jackman, do you have a second? I just wanted to add, because Christina does so much with kids, that we did something called Leyendo con Galita, oh. and we reached 19,000 children, Okay. Uh, clicked onto that, and it's illustrated Spanish language children's books. So while we could not perform live, we had been doing... Leyendo con Galita and Dale en Familia, which is Google interviewing artists. We also had about 3,000 people who, uh, so we did reach virtually. Uh, for us, the, of course, the spirit of attending something in live is very different, as you said, Franklin, right. than virtual. Mm -hmm. But right. it's, still, it's still good to be doing both, and we did reach all of those children who needed something online. There was very little online Spanish language content. So that's, right. that's what we're trying to do. 
Thank yeah. you so much. We need to improve on that. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for tonight's uh, broadcast. I want to thank uh, Rebecca Medrano from Gala Theater and Maria Cristina Caballero from Dialogue on Diversity for ending Hisp Hispanic Heritage Month with us. Now, tonight, remember, uh, it would have been the second presidential debate tonight. Oh, We're God. not having that take place, but the both candidates will have a town hall. I understand that at 9 p.m., NBC will host President Donald Trump and ABC right. will host uh, Vice President Biden. So you know what you need to do uh, right now. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Franklin. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.